Would you grab your seat right now and, and, uh, and, and grab, <laughs> you are good at high-fiving. I always think it's kind of awkward, isn't it? Uh, um, we'll get good at it. Why don't you grab your Bible? Would you, with me, turn to the book of John? John is in the New Testament. We are in chapter 8 today. Uh, we're, we're in a series called John's Witness of Jesus, and this is a, a, a critical um, piece of this uh, study for us as we're looking at at who Jesus is through the eyes of one of his um, closest friends, one of his closest followers. His name is John. This is not John the Baptist. This is John, really, the, the, the apostle, this, this one that became one of Jesus' closest friends. I love that we have here, 2,000 years after Jesus' life, we have an eyewitness account of who Jesus is and, and, and what he loves and what he, what he values, what he talks about. And so we as a church are learning to become Jesus' church, and so we're looking at Jesus and, and trying to learn from him. Hey, if you got in here without a bulletin, we want to make sure that you get one. Uh, just throw your hand up. These guys have got bulletins and pens because there's sermon notes in there. You're going to want to follow along as well as connection cards, giving envelopes. We'll collect those cards and those envelopes, the giving later on. Would you guys just come forward, Steve, Charlene, and just make sure everybody's got a, a bulletin if they need one. Just throw your hand up if you didn't get one. We're going to look at John chapter 8. Grab your notes out of your bulletin, and uh, we're going to look at this passage together. I'm super excited because Devin Meacham, our Life for Kids pastor, is going to preach with me today. Uh, it, it's, a, it's an extreme honor, a privilege to get to do this together. Um, Devin, I love this guy. I love watching him grow. you got to understand that um, this, this church, this team is, is crazy. We are, we are crazy in this. That we are constantly um, trusting that Jesus is moving in our hearts, and we put people in the game way before they're, they're ready. And, and uh, I say that with way, all excitement about what God is doing in, in his life. He's been on the team a year and a half now. And, um, you know, coming out of ministry, actually, um, um, bailed out of ministry for a while. You were, you were renting out, I think, storage units and when, when we first met, and then he ended up working at a bank for a while, and then uh, slowly as God got him connected here, he's reawakened his heart to the passion of what God's called him to, to be a man in ministry, and, and, and first ministering at home in this family, and then learning to, to, to be a, a pastor in a church, and it's so cool to see what God's doing in this guy. I mean, on average right now, we're averaging through the summer over 200 kids in Life for Kids. I mean, that's larger than most churches in America uh, that this guy is responsible for, and there are kids. And we, we, we care desperately about our kids experiencing God, um, not waiting until they're like 25 to experience God, but that in our, in our kids' services and all of our Life for Kids experiences that they're encountering Jesus and learning to trust Jesus. And, and he's he'd leading a team of over 100 people on the weekends that are helping um, our kids experience Jesus. And many of you are on his team. And can we just thank him for his work and his, uh, his ministry here? We're going to look at John chapter 8 together right at the beginning, and this is, um, if you notice, if you've got an ESV Bible, I think even NIV and New Living, they might bracket um, this chunk of Scripture, verses 1 through 11. It's actually the last verse of chapter 7 through um, verse 11 of chapter 8. And the brackets are there for this, that actually some manuscripts didn't include this story early on. But as scholars have gone back, they look, and many will even argue that John himself added this story later on to, this, to, to his collection of Jesus' life and ministry. And so... We look at that, plus we look at the confidence of all the editors. If you look at the, the beginning of your Bible, at the, uh, all the guys that uh, went into putting this together, I mean, it, there is hundreds and, and thousands of scholars that have gone into all the different translations of the Bible. And so we're super excited that God decided to include this piece of his heart for us today to learn from. And so we, we really come at this passage with a lot of humility and a lot of expectation. And, and, and the expectancy in my heart is this, that God would speak to us. And I think that this story is going to be one that, that many of us kind of remember. And, and this is going to be a foundation-setting uh, conversation for us as a church, really culture-setting for who we are. And, and I believe that God wants you to be a part of this mission here, and, and God has called you here. You're not here on accident. And, and we're excited that God has brought you here. But at the same time, we want you to understand that this is the kind of team that we're trying to be. We're trying to be Jesus' church. And we don't do that perfectly, absolutely not, but we look at stories like this where Jesus is teaching us uh, uh, to really learn to wrap our lives around and, and, and really care about what Jesus cares about. And so we're going to look at John chapter 8 today, and I just want to encourage you to engage your heart. Would you pray with me? And then we'll look to God's word. Jesus, right now, we, we just open our hearts. Speak to us, God. Help Devin and I not to say too much or too little, God. I pray that by your spirit, through your word, God, you would speak 
You would convict us. You would change us. You would challenge us. God, for those in this room that don't know you and do not follow you, God, I pray that you would bring an awareness of their sin and their desperate need for you, God, that they would see eternity at stake, God, and come to a place of, of literally repentance before you right now. We trust, God, that, that you are changing our hearts. Make us your church, Jesus. Teach us to be your church. Teach us to care about what you care about, how you view people. Help us to see how you view people, God. We love you, trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, here we go. John chapter 8, starting in 753. They went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down, and he taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now, in the law of Moses, commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and he said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Now go, and from now on, sin no more. Like I said a moment ago, this story is going to become very pivotal, I think, for us as a church. There's something that I want you to write down in your notes here in a second, but you've got to understand the, the characters here that are in this story. Jesus, God himself, is on the scene. He comes to the temple to start teaching people. A crowd gathers around him. Then here come these Pharisees. If you're not familiar with Bible language, Pharisees are the religious guys, the churchy church people, the leaders of, of kind of the most strict kind of sect that, that, that were Jews that, that really worked their tails off to be religiously perfect. At the same time, they, they caught a woman in the act of adultery. And so here we have this woman literally drugged from the act of adultery into this kind of confrontational scene Leveraging these, these Pharisees, these religious leaders, leveraging her and her brokenness and her sin to try to test and trap Jesus, to try to make a religious point, hoping that they could trick him, find fault in him, and, and, and accuse him of some sort of heresy and then go on and, and kill him. That's their hope. That's their motive. And in this story, we have a very interesting dynamic and a dynamic that I think is going to speak to us because many of us in this room struggle much like these Pharisees, these religious leaders do. Others of us in this room struggle much like this woman who was caught in adultery do. And these different characters, Jesus um, really addresses very individually and very pointedly to both. And so I want you to listen and and really engage your heart in this. First off, for those of us that that really have struggled being kind of rule keepers keepers and and religious people, and we've, we've grown up in this kind of system and checked a lot of religious boxes and said, hey, I'm pretty good because I don't do as much bad stuff as all those other people. We, we tend to find ourselves, much like these guys, in a place of kind of judgment over somebody in, 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 in stories and in life. We find ourselves in a place of critiquing and, and kind of identifying their sin and maybe even helping others to see their sin. That's called gossip. We, we, we tend to point it out in our own hearts, and then we, we recognize it, and we kind of maybe bring attention to it so other people can know how bad they are. And, and, and this is really called judgmentalism. This is called criticism. This is called, uh, really, at, at its simplest point, this boils down to what was to be known as hypocrisy. I mean, think about it. The religious guys, religious, like rule keeper dudes, caught a woman in the act of adultery. How'd they do that? Where were they? What were they doing that would enable them to catch a woman in the act of adultery? It doesn't, it doesn't say that they, they caught a woman that, that had thought about adultery, right? They didn't, caught a, they didn't catch a woman who had previously committed adultery. They caught a woman in the act of adultery. I mean, you think of just the hypocrisy of the moment. And here they are dragging her in front of Jesus saying, hey, look how bad she is. What do we do? We, do, we, do we stone her to death? Let's go. they got rocks in their hands. Let's roll. Jesus, let's do what us good Jews, what us good religious people do. Let's, let's throw rocks at her. I want you to write this down. Judgment in our hearts, judgment creeps in as we lack awareness. What I mean by awareness is really awareness of our own hearts 
and where we are and where we stand before God. Judgment tends to creep into our lives as we lack awareness of who we are and where we've come from. For those of us that have experienced Jesus before and we've said yes to him and we've, we've come to him in repentance, we have a significant moment and a transition in our lives where we can look back and we remember very vividly the grace of God poured out on our lives. We can look back in, in, in great confidence and go, that is the moment, that is the time when I finally put my trust in the power and the love of Jesus, that I'm not going to keep trying to clean myself up and make my life work and, and do this life better, but I'm going to fully trust, put my faith that God's grace is enough for me and that I can stand right before God the Father at judgment day because of Jesus' love and his grace poured out on me. Amen. But at the same time, we, we tend to kind of creep away from that moment as we lose awareness, kind of awareness erodes in our hearts of where we come from, the sin that God drug us out of. And we get in this spot of kind of judgment that, that creeps into our hearts the further and further we get from the grace of God. And here's what happens. The eroding is really simple. It's really small. None of us mean to do it. I know I don't mean to do it. But this eroding that happens in our heart, it just, it just kind of incrementally, bit by bit, inch by inch, we just start to kind of lose perspective of the grace of God that's been poured out on us. As we make little decisions, as we make kind of little compromises in our life, we, 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 our, hearts, our hearts start to get kind of hard. And the harder our hearts are, the easier it is to lose perspective of the grace of God in our lives. And here's the thing. Those of us that struggle the most remembering the grace of God in our lives tend to be the most critical and judgmental people. Those of us that are self-justified, self-righteous, we don't need grace. Or so we think. Oh, yeah, we'll talk about grace. We'll talk, oh, by God's grace. We'll say these nice Christian things about God's grace, but in real kind of retrospect, it's really all about our effort and, and, and what we do to get ourselves right before God, and especially in comparison to everyone else. And so we've got this laundry list of, of really kind of this, this resume of our spirituality. And anyone that's quick to point anything out in our lives, we're quick to hold this resume up and go, look at all the things that I've done. Look at how spiritual I am. Look how many times I go to church in a week. Look at all this stuff I do and our hearts are shriveling up and getting harder and harder all the time. This lack of awareness erodes the, the ability for us to give grace to others. We stand in judgment a lot more often. Here's how it looks in my life. <clears throat> for, for me to get in a place of, of, of judgment towards people, I tend to get either arrogant or I tend to get insecure. Very simple. I, I, I think too highly of myself or I think too lowly of myself. Do you identify with these spots in life? We get here, don't we? You can say yes. It's okay. This is a real life, real life ministries. Yeah. Uh, this woman, I mean, talk about real life. The story is it, right? And I think too highly of myself many times or, or too lowly of myself. But here's the thing. Both of these ends of the spectrum are both uh, the same sin, just opposite ends of it, thinking too much about myself. When I'm thinking too highly of myself, I have a tendency to, to quickly blame others. I think I wrote some of these ideas. Just so you can start to kind of get uh, a, a taste in your own heart, I, I have a tendency to blame others or I'll, I'll be quick, I'll be quick to, to find others' faults. One of the things that I do classic all the time is I assign motives. So there's an action, there's a gap. Maybe somebody let me down or it didn't go the way I thought it would go. And so in the middle of this gap, one of our mentors talks about it like this. There's this gap and, and, and I tend to fill that gap a lot of times with suspicion. And I'm, I'm assigning motives, you know, like you say, and this has never happened, I don't think, before. And so this is just a hypothetical uh, thing, totally. But Devin say he showed up 30 minutes late to work, Right. And uh, around here, this culture that we expect a lot of each other, we work hard, this is a driven culture, and so when uh, he shows up 30 minutes late to work and I don't know about it, I have this, I'm left with this quandary of going, hey, what do I do? Do I, do I trust him or do I suspect something of him? And, and many times if I'm arrogant, I have a tendency to assign a motive, well, he's just a slacker and he slept in late. That's what all slackers do, Right? But, but really, I didn't know that, that he was, like, cranking on his motorcycle, and it wouldn't start for, like, 45 minutes. He's, like, dripping in sweat out in his driveway. He's running up and down the street trying to jump start or, you know, pop the clutch or whatever he's trying to do, if there are any motorcycle mechanics in the, in the room. Uh, this it's is all hypothetical. Right. Any, any offers welcome. All hypothetical. And, uh, uh, 
But it's so easy, isn't it, for us to go, man, well, he, he, didn't, he, didn't, he wasn't trying hard enough, or his heart was wrong in that, that he, that, he, that he didn't plan well enough for his motorcycle to not work, right? And I think we have this tendency, and I know I do, that I get arrogant, and so then I assign motives. Well, the other thing that, that in the insecure spot that, that many of us have gotten, uh, we, we have this tendency to compare ourselves. I don't know um, if you're a Seahawks fan, but this insecure thing is a familiar feeling for those of us that are Seahawks fans, right? <laughs> How are they going to screw up this week, right? How are they going to drop the ball? Are they going to do this? You know, and what I love is that, that, that they're proving us all wrong right now. I mean, in the last, last night, right, 40 to 10, I mean, these are moments that we can hang our hats on, unlike Raiders fans who just, like, struggle perpetually, right? Uh, <laughs> um, we... We, we all got to encourage Norm and Brennan. I think they're the only Raiders fans in, in all of Washington State, I think. Um, um, and we get to this spot, though, where we compare ourselves. Well, the Seahawks are way better than the, the Raiders, but they're not near as good as Denver Broncos, or so we thought, right, until last night. But in this place, yeah, for each hit, right? Um, but in this, <laughs> this place of, of insecurity, we always get to the spot where we're comparing ourselves. Well, I'm not as good as them. I'm not as that. And, and really, comparison is judgment, too. And we're making judgments on where people are. Even though we're in an insecure spot, we're not in the arrogant spot talking down to people. We're in an insecure spot, but we're still casting judgment on where people are as we're comparing ourselves. Us arrogant or us insecure is the worst us. It's not who God's called us and designed us to be. Yet we get in this spot, and, and judgment creeps in as we lack this awareness of who we are and the grace that God has poured out on our lives. So write this down in real life. Look at your own heart. Now, the religious leaders that are involved in this particular scenario are attempting to set this elaborate trap. They caught this woman in adultery, and now they're attempting to use her brokenness, her shame, her guilt to put Jesus in what they view as a virtually no-win scenario. See, what do you say, Jesus? They come to him, they cast her down in front of him. Jesus, our law says that we're supposed to kill her. What do you say? Now, should he condemn this woman, he stands in violation of the Roman law, the occupying forces regarding execution. Only the Romans can kill people. Should he show her mercy and compassion, he stands in violation of the holy law that they had just quoted accurately to him, that it defined the culture of the nation of Israel for the last 2,000 years or more. What do you say, Jesus? He says nothing. Instead, he bends down and he starts writing in the dirt. Now, a lot of speculation has gone into what was he writing. Was he writing a list of their sin? Was he writing the Ten Commandments? Greg Turbin will tell you that he, he was writing a list of all their girlfriends' names. I mean, either way, <laughs> he's ignoring them, Right? So he's ignoring him, so they keep pestering him. It's like, it's like a three-year-old. They just kept pestering him. Jesus, what do you say, Jesus? What do you say? Je teach us, teacher. Come on, what do you got? And he stands up and gives them an incredible opportunity for growth in one statement. He says, he who is among you that is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. He put them, he forced them into a posture of self-reflection and self-assessment that they didn't necessarily ask for. Now, as a Pharisee, I'm asking myself, wait, whoa, whoa, my sin? According to everything that I know, I am righteous in condemning this woman in front of you. This is about her. This is not about me. Jesus has the audacity to point at my heart. And yet, one by one, beginning with the oldest, they turned and they walked away. They had lost perspective of their own hearts as they stood in judgment of this woman. Now, I, it's very easy for me to forget the grace that Christ has given me. When I get to this arrogant spot in my walk through life, I can convince myself very quickly that I don't need the grace of God to sustain me. I don't need the grace of God to give me a purpose. I don't need the grace of God to set me free. And it's impossible for me to show that grace and extend that grace to other people. I forget that six years ago, it was me standing in front of Jesus like this adulterous woman. I forget the garbage that Jesus pulled me out of and set my feet on solid ground. He set me free from a porn addiction and chasing women, my marriage in shambles and falling apart before it started. And the pain that I caused by dragging my wife and my kids, dragging them around for me trying to figure out what it meant to be a man on my own. And I forget the grace that I need now more than ever. The grace to hold my head high because of what Jesus did on the cross, what Jesus is doing in my heart. Not anything that I've done, not anything I will do, not any false image I can create of myself. 
And if I am not passionately pursuing Jesus, if I'm not surrounding myself intentionally by men who are older and wiser than me, who challenge me in my walk with Jesus, who challenge me in my relationship with my wife and with my girls, if the mission that God has put in front of us to reach this world for Jesus one person at a time is not my focal point, is not my bullseye, is not the force that drives me to move, I'm just standing in the crowd, casting judgment, ready to throw a stone. When I see guys who are in that same position that I was in not that long ago, you know, selfish and arrogant and proud, praying the prayer that I prayed, hey God, thanks for your strength so I can go and figure this out on my own. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks a lot. It's so quick for me to pick up a rock of judgment ready to throw it at them. I judge people's hearts. I judge their motives. I judge their work ethic. I judge their character. I'm critical of whether or not the Holy Spirit of God who saved me, who is continually restoring my soul to the heart of the Father, is working in their lives at all. I may as well be throwing rocks at them. Who do I think I am? Now, Richie said this a few minutes ago, and it's really been hitting home with me the last few days, is the less aware that we are of our own sin, the less aware I am of my own sin, the more critical and judgmental I am. I think that's true for all of us. Now, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, he says, Judge not so that you won't be judged. For the judgment that you proclaim will be used against you to judge you. The measure that you use will be used to measure you. Don't point at the speck in your brother's eye when you have a log in your own. Now, all of us have this log in our eye. It's big, it's ugly, it gets infected, it's gross. But as soon as we see a speck in somebody else's eye, we are quick to point it out. Now, God created us for real relationship with himself and with other people. As soon as we start comparing ourselves, either insecurely or arrogantly, as soon as we start puffing ourselves up, or tearing other people down or tearing myself down, as soon as we start gossiping and need to shut our mouths, or if we draw inside of ourselves to hide, we are incapable of living in the grace and power that God created us for. Now, God, God created us for a purpose. What Jesus did with these Pharisees was he pointed them to look at their own hearts. What he does with us now is to point for us to look at our own hearts. We have to allow Christ to move and work in our lives to reveal the grace that he's given us so that we can extend it to other people. And at the same time, we need to allow him and be okay with him revealing stuff to us that we may not want to see. Last thing I want you to write this down is there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Put yourself in the shoes of this woman for a moment. Some of you know these shoes very well. You walked in here today wearing them. Walked in here kind of feeling exposed, feeling kind of shameful about last night or last week, feeling condemned by maybe a family member or somebody that you're with, like they should have known better, you should have known better, I told you so, feeling these, this weight that this woman felt as she walked and stood before Jesus. I love how this story ends. Jesus was left there alone with this woman standing before him. Just imagine how lonely she felt, how insecure she felt, how exposed she felt, all of her sin on display for everyone to hear about, all of her wickedness, all of her pain, all of that that, that she's been kind of just flailing in in secret and in the dark is now all brought into the light. Some of you know exactly what this feeling is. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Romans 8.1 is one of our, our, our favorite verses around here. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus. For those of us that are willing to stand before Jesus, all of our wickedness, all of our pain, all of our shame, completely exposed, there's now no condemnation for those of us that are in Christ Jesus. And here we see Jesus embodying that verse, Romans 8.1. We also see him embodying John 1.14. I think it's also 17. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. 
And we have seen His glory, glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus, when He says, I don't condemn you either, is so full of grace. And when He says, now go and sin no more, He's so full of truth. But many of us, we, we walk into this meeting with Jesus face to face, and we're standing here today, and we, we sense His presence as we gather like this, and we go, okay, things have got to change. I've got I've to clean this life up. I, I gotta quit with this addiction. I gotta, I gotta quit struggling in this relationship. I gotta quit doing these things that I've always done. There's a proverb that says, as a, as a dog returns to his vomit, so a fool returns to his folly. We're like, man, I'm just that dog. And what happens is we get locked in this cycle of shame and condemnation where we feel like because of the sin that we committed last night or last week, we get, we get kind of rolled over into this spot where all we deserve is that vomit we just threw up last week. All that we're worthy of is just this kind of pain and this turmoil and this shame that we heap on ourselves. And guess what? We have this spiritual enemy, the, the accuser is what his name is, Lucifer, Satan. And he actually is speaking these lies into our heart and into our ears, helping us to kind of continue or perpetuate this cycle where we just go back in shame, in guilt, in condemnation. We come before God in this place of like, oh, I'm horrible. Oh, I'm garbage. Oh, I've got nothing. Please forgive me. And he's already saying, I've already forgiven you. You have no condemnation. Nation. Now go and sin no more. And then we go, well, I, I know I'm going to sin again. And life is just hard. And, I, and this addiction is just too much. And this marriage is this. And this struggle is that. Here's what's happened. We've sold out to this lie. We think that this is all there is. We've sold out thinking that, that, that I've got to always return to my vomit this way. I gotta always just kind of keep coming back to how bad life is and how little I deserve and how messed up I am. And we walk literally putting this condemnation on ourselves day in and day out. Many of us, we are driven by this insecurity and this pain and this shame that we have given ourselves and continue to. Yet here is the Savior of the universe, the one that we're gonna stand before judgment someday at eternity. We're gonna stand before him, and here he is modeling the grace that he has given to us with this woman standing before him in this place of shame. And I think we need to hear today that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I've told you this before, but my best sermons, nobody hears. I'm preaching my guts out to myself. And if there's ever a sermon that I'm preaching to myself, it's this one right here, Romans 8, 1. Richie, you don't got to walk in that shame and that guilt because of your past anymore, because of your, 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 your mess up, because of the pain that you've caused your family, because of those things, the betrayal that you've done, because of the lack of leadership and the lack of wisdom, because of those things that you've screwed up. And you don't got to, you don't got to, that's not you, that's not your identity, Richie. You can stand up in confidence, not in confidence in yourself like you got it all together, but in confidence of the grace of God that has been poured out on you. I love Paul's plea to Jesus. He says, Lord, please take this thorn from me. Please. He says, I, I pleaded with the Lord three times. And Jesus came to him and said, Paul, isn't my grace sufficient for you? My power is made perfect in your weakness. And Paul says, so then, therefore, I'll boast all the more in my weakness. It's not I that save me. It's not I that bring grace to myself. It's not I that justify and bring freedom. That it is the grace of God that is being poured on, on us, adulterous women, this adulterous generation that continue to go back to the vomit that we've, we just threw up last week. We come to Jesus in this posture of humility going, God, you've already saved me. You've already taken this, this sin away. God, I choose today to walk in this freedom. I choose today to walk in this life. I choose today to walk in this grace. Really, we are preaching to ourselves, making these statements of faith that God does love us, that he has chosen us, that he doesn't condemn us. But we are to be a people as a church, as real life. And we, we take people right where we are, naked and ashamed, exposed and condemned, walking in the middle of real life and the pain and the hurt but I love Jesus' acceptance, his grace of us there, and the truth of go and sin no more. This is not all that life has to offer. This is not your identity. The cycle of sin is not you. There is life beyond our sin and our past and the shame that we continue to heap on ourselves. There is freedom that is possible. For many of us, it's hard to sing these songs about freedom because we don't feel it. But I'll tell you what. 
There's a process that we are in of speaking this truth into our own hearts, speaking faith to ourselves and to each other. I love that in Hebrews, the writer tells us to encourage one another daily so that we're not hardened by sin's deceitfulness. It creeps in so quick. We lose awareness and we go, well, I'm good. They're not, obviously. Let me help you see why. We get in this place of judgment. This is going to be a culture of grace and truth. We're going to pursue Jesus passionately and know that he's going to bring people that are in the middle of messes of life, of real life. We don't push people away because life is hard. We, we open our arms wide and help them experience the grace and the love of Jesus. We know we don't have the answer in of ourselves as a church, as a people. We know that Jesus is the only source of hope that is out there, that is possible for any one of us. And we want you to know today, if you come in here distant, far from God, hard-hearted, not having a relationship with Jesus, we want you to experience life in him. Here's where it starts, in a place of faith, like this woman before him, saying, no one condemns me, Lord, and hear Jesus' words to you, then neither do I. Go and sin no more. Become the man or woman that God has called you and designed you to be. A life of sin and shame and guilt and condemnation, that is not who God has called you to be. Learn to walk in faith. Learn to walk in this new identity. That if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. We don't stand in a place of judgment and criticism, trying to compare ourselves and make ourselves feel better about ourselves, trying to, trying to put everybody else down so that we kind of feel like we're holy enough. No. We go, God, you are so good. You are so loving. You're so gracious. Thank you for your grace in my life. God, help me to be a man or a woman that helps others experience the same grace that you have poured out so amazingly on my life. We're not driven by shame and guilt. We are driven by the grace of God in our lives. We don't pursue Jesus so we get kind of forgiven and ridden of, of shame. We pursue Jesus so that his grace overwhelms us and so that we can learn to pour out that same grace on this entire city, this region that God has called us to. I love that God makes all things new. And I love that God brought you here today. Here's how we're going to end the service today in communion. In fact, service, would you come stand up here in the front, right up here, just a step or two off the front row? We don't normally do it like this, but we do take communion every week. If you're not familiar with communion, the bread represents, represents Jesus' body. The juice represents his blood. We take communion as, a, as really a symbol of faith, Jesus' life, and his sacrifice put inside of us so that now we, we know that it's not us that saves us, but eternity is, is completely changed for us. So we don't have to stand in fear of judgment of God. And we can stand eternity uh, in eternity with God because of Jesus. This act of communion is us putting our faith in Jesus, literally. Not just figuratively or like a, like a mind thing, like, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but going, these symbols are his body and his blood. Brad, give me one of those, please. This is, this is his, his body that was that was beaten and, and crushed. This is blood that was poured out. We take these symbolically, but also very passionately. We go, God, by your grace, are we able to be here today as your church? Here's how we're gonna do it. I'm gonna leave these guys up here. I'm gonna invite you to come and to pick up your communion elements, maybe with your family, maybe by yourself, however you wanna come. You can, you're invited then to, to take it back to your seat and take communion as you're ready. You know, maybe you'll pray for a minute or two and get your heart prepared to receive communion and then you'll take it in your seat. Others of you, I want you to grab it and, then, and you need to spend some time on really before Jesus in a place of repentance up here on, on the stage, you know, kind of kneeling down here or whatever, standing up here. We want you to have this opportunity to just spend time with Jesus in reflection of where your heart is at. And I'm also gonna invite a few of our leaders, elders, group leaders, some of you people in the room, pastors, if you're here, up here, we'd love to pray with you. Some of you are gonna grab your elements and you're gonna come straight to one of these people that would love to pray with you and talk with you. Here's the thing, anybody standing up here has experienced what it's like to be that woman standing in front of Jesus. None of us stands in a place of judgment. We all stand in a place overwhelmed by the grace of God in our lives. 
We want so much for you to experience that same grace. Let us pray with you. Let us encourage you. Let us talk with you. For service, I had a lady come up to me, and, and she said, I was so scared to come up here. I thought you would walk away from me when I walked up here. Stuck in an addiction to painkillers, alcohol, all kinds of stuff going on in her life. So proud of her. She took the step. So proud Mike's dad's going to get baptized here in a few minutes. Taking a step. God's leadership and, and God's, God's guidance in our lives, they're always a step of faith. It always feels like this massive risk, but we know that God's leadership is best, and every time we take that step, it's worth the risk. And I just want to challenge you to not allow your comfort to dictate you this morning, but to respond to God's leadership. If you're in a place of humility, you've been judging, you've been critical, you've been hard-hearted, get your heart right before Jesus. Repent. Don't stay there justified, rationalizing your position. Get right with God. If you've never experienced his grace, we want you to experience his grace today. As we sing this, I want to invite you to come. I want to invite you to pray. I want to invite you to pray with us. If you want to go back to your seat, that's fine. We'll sing this song and worship together, singing about this, this all things being made new in our lives. Let's worship, let's respond.